This meeting is being recorded. Good afternoon and welcome to our attendees. Uh, we are thrilled to be presenting a live Zoom performance of Sliver of a Full Moon. We'd like to share our gratitude to playwright Mary Catherine Nagel for her continued collaboration with the wider legal community and for allowing us to share this work with ABA. This panel is sponsored by the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice and is one uh, of a many of series of rapid response webinars. We are actively planning additional programming on various issues, so please visit AmericanBar.org slash CRSJ for updates on these programs. Once again, AmericanBar.org backslash CRSJ for updates on the programs. My name is Dr. Caroline Dunn, and I am the have the privilege of being the director of this staged reading this afternoon, and I'd like to welcome you all for joining us uh, this afternoon, this morning, um, from wherever you are. I would like to note that I am coming to you from Tavangnar, which is known as the Greater Tongva Nation, um, unceded territory of the Tongva Nation in Southern California, what's now known as Los Angeles. Um, I encourage mm -hmm. and welcome all of you to honor and to acknowledge the um, folks on whose land that you inhabit. Most likely, um, we inhabit through um, unceded territory, and we, we also inhabit through um, land theft and loss. So please understand that we are coming to one another in these spaces um, of the ancestral lands of the indigenous peoples of this land. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A and use of the chat box for commentary. If you do not see the controls, please ensure that your screen is not idle. I will be monitoring the Q&A. Um, Ali, as well as Ali, our um, intrepid stage manager for today's performance, and we'll do our best to address them, time permitting. We will be sharing a recording of the program with everyone who is registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. And so a little uh, production note on what you'll be seeing this afternoon um, and a little bit of the history of this play. Um, this play first was written in 2013 by Mary Catherine Nagel, a playwright, attorney, um, and screenwriter and overall wonderful human being and activist. Um, and we are very, uh, very glad to have Mary Catherine uh, join us a little bit later as her schedule allows. Um, this play is about the original passage in 2013 of the Violence Against Women Act, the reauthorization which included the native provisions and the recognition of tribal sovereignty. Um, normally you would see us on stage behind music stands and in the actors interacting with one another. But um, as you all know, during the pandemic, uh, Zoom became a, a platform of everyone able to get um, productions done and able to get stories out there, especially indigenous stories. And so for that, we are grateful for this. So, um, add, but as with Zoom, you might see a little bit of a lag you might hear a little bit of, you know, some of stepping on each other um, as, although Zoom has gotten better in terms of its, um, of its platform for theatrical and staged readings, we still do have a, a little bit of issues. But anyhow, uh, we are here together to tell this story um, of this ongoing story in Indian country of the fight for tribal sovereignty and the fight to protect our missing and murdered indigenous relatives. So without further ado, I would like to present Sliver of a Full Moon by Mary Catherine Nagel, presented for the American Bar Association, November 18th, 2022. Everyone stands together. I remember where I was. I remember what I was doing. I remember what I was thinking. And I will never forget. I was on the floor of the house. In my home in Fairfax. On my reservation. In Cherokee. 
in Alaska. Talela. Watching CNN. C-SPAN. Facebook. Watching the vote. Working for votes. I couldn't breathe. I was so nervous. All I could do was pray. What's the vote? 30. We got 30? 8 to 18. Congressman enters and passes Tom Cole. We need your vote. You got my vote. 31. Thank you. 62. My whole life. I've dreamed of this. 85. I prayed for this. 114. Congresswoman enters and passes by Tom Cole. You got my vote, Tom. Thank you. 115. Everything depends on this. What if we lose? We can't lose. I just prayed. To creator. Yeah. Oh my God. 201. 201? Oh. oh my God. Got this. 215. <gasps> Holy smokes. 216. We got this. 217. Is this for real? 218. We did it. 218. 218? They're still coming. More votes. 235. 246. 250. 285. 286. 286. 286. 286 votes. It didn't feel real. I had to call Jax. Harry texted me. I just started texting. I started crying. I could hardly see who I was texting. I was crying so hard. I had to scream. I scared my neighbors. I did a victory dance. I prayed for my sisters. It just seemed unreal. It felt like a dream. It was amazing. Humbling. It was a miracle. Yolanda, Pauline, Blossom, and Erlina join Melissa, Deborah, Billy Joe, Lisa, Nettie, and Diane. They stand together. This is my story. This is my story. This is my story. The story of my sister. My daughter. Story of my mother. And her mother. And her mother's mother. My grandmother. My granddaughter. This is the story of my life, of my past, of my people. This, this is, my, is story. My, story. my story. This is my story. At first, it was hard to share it. I had to keep it a secret. I was too ashamed, too embarrassed, too afraid, scared, forgotten. I was silenced. I thought I'd be judged for something I never did. Something my daughter never did. This wasn't her fault. Then we came together. We stopped the silence. If I wasn't Native, my story would be different. If I didn't live on my reservation, my story would be different. If I wasn't a citizen of a sovereign Indian nation, my story would be different. My daughter was murdered on a reservation. When it comes to justice, that shouldn't make her story different. This is my story. Is my story. story. Is my this story. Is my story. And I'm here to share it. Billy Joe steps forward. All others exit. One sunny afternoon in May. I was returning my daughters to their father per our agreement. I dropped them off and made sure he was home and they were in the house before leaving as usual. But their father walked out to stand beside my car. Cautious, I stayed in my car with the door locked, but the windows were down. He seemed agreeable enough at first but then he became angry because I didn't wish him a happy anniversary. I stated that I didn't think it was appropriate under the circumstances. And he suddenly lunged into my car 
through the window and he snatched my my bag. He removed a small address book. He flipped through it and became angry. Then he suddenly lunged in again and snatched my car keys from the ignition and started walking away. And he was going to throw the keys. I live in the mountains of Western North Carolina. There are trees and woods, things like that, all around, pretty much everywhere. And that was the only car key I had. And I thought, if he throws that car key, if I don't have a way to get out of here, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I was trying to get the key. And he turned and he finally said, okay, you can have your key. And he threw it on the ground. So when I leaned down to get the keys, he kicked me. And I rolled down a little hill. At the time, my youngest daughter was standing beside my car at the bottom of this little hill. And I didn't know she was outside. I thought she was still in the house. When I rolled down the hill, I rolled into her and she fell. And he grabbed her. I was holding her, trying to comfort her. But he grabbed her hands and he pulled so hard that I began to slide across the ground. So I let go. And he took her and my other daughter and he went immediately to the police station and he got there before me. Can I help you? Do I need to get a protective order? Okay, well... Uh, Can you do that for me? We don't have jurisdiction over non-natives. Yeah, my wife's enrolled. And she's a danger to her children. Fill this out and process it. Husband exits. It was so humiliating for me to be sitting at the police department. I had leaves and grass in my hair, dirt on my clothes, and my clothes were torn. And on my side, near my rib area, within the next day or two, formed a bruise that was shaped perfectly like the bottom of his foot from where he had kicked me. There must be something you can do. He's not enrolled. But he has my children. And a protective order against you. So whatever you do, don't go near him. He had my children. All I had was a bruise shaped just like his foot. Maybe you've never heard a Native woman tell her story before. Maybe because you've seen movies like The Last of the Mohicans or Peter Pan. You think at some point in time that we cease to exist, but we are still here. Some of us live on reservations. Some of us live in suburbs. We also live in Washington, D.C. Harry enters. She is at her Department of Justice office. After the passage of the first Violence Against Women Act in 1994. Hello. Hi. Excuse me. Do you need something? I'm Terry. Terry Henry. Okay. Is this the Office on Violence Against Women? You're looking at it. There's no carpet. Is that a problem? No, I, I just thought that you thought because today's your first day, we'd roll out the red carpet. I thought there would be carpet. Yes. You work for the federal government now. You'll learn to do without. The OJ woman hands Terry a large stack of papers. Here's what you'll need to start with. I want you to draft the RFPs that we send to tribes. VAWA provides for significant chunk of change. VAWA, you know what that is? Yes. Violence Against Women Act. I know. We work to stop violence. We don't promote it. I get it. 
Oh, and uh, mm -hmm. our reports to Congress, you'll be responsible for writing those. Basically, you'll be doing all of the policy work for implementation of VAWA uh, uh, grants in Indian country. Any questions? Yeah, I have a few. Good and welcome. We do so much work for Native Americans. It's nice to finally have one in the office. DOJ woman exits. Terry returns to her paperwork at her desk. Lisa enters. My mother was a very beautiful Indian woman. And my stepfather, well, he was non native, a white man. And he was very abusive, ungodly. The earliest that I remember is being four years old. We were in this trailer house and my mom was screaming. I'm under the table, I'm screaming, the lights off. The light from the outside is coming in from the post. And the door is here, the couch is here, the TV is here, and the gun rack is here. And the table in the kitchen is right here, and I'm under the table. My mom is screaming, no, David, no. And I see him grab the gun, and he starts beating my mom over the head with the butt of the shotgun until the only screams that could be heard were mine from under the table. And I think he beat her to what he believed was to death. Put the gun back on the rack and called her a bitch. Walked into the bedroom, shut the door, sat down on the squeaky bed. And then I heard the thud thud of his cowboy boots as he laid down squeaking again and he went to sleep. So I crawled over to my mom because I think she's dead and I'm crying so hard and I put my face down to her mouth to see if I can feel her breath and I can't feel it. So then I start crying again and I'm only four and I make myself stop crying. I put my head down on her chest to see if I can feel it rising and it was. So I grabbed a blanket from the couch and covered her up and sat by her all night. And if I fell asleep, I'd get mad at myself because, you know, hurry up and check to see if she's still breathing. And it's not that I could have saved her. It's just that I didn't want her to die alone. Billy Joe, Diane, and Melissa support Lisa. Lisa isn't an actress. She's a survivor. I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. We're all survivors. There were times when we would be, he'd be chasing us. And there was this field and I'd grab her and say, come on, mama, the moon is full. And we'd crawl out to this field until we got to the woods. And I took her to the hiding place where we'd listen to him to his screams that would echo, his screams about how he was going to kill us when he found us. And she would lay down and go to sleep. And if I thought I heard him coming, I would wake her up and take her deeper into the woods because he'd been in Vietnam. So when I reflect back, he was afraid of the woods. He was afraid of the night. In the woods, the night, we were safe. The moon was our sanctuary, if we could make it. Department of Justice woman enters. I found a rat this morning. Yeah, a rat underneath my desk. It ripped open a bag of chips. You want me to buy you a bag of chips? Look, I, I really need to talk to you. About rats? about the grants were given tribes. What about them? I'm not sure they're making much of a difference. So give them to the different tribes. That's not the issue. What's the issue? Our women are raped. They go missing. They're murdered. And our offices give tribes the money they need to deal with that. Yes, but after the fact. The fact of what? 
We come in after the violence has occurred. By the time the women walk in the door of one of our programs, they're already a victim. Right. You're not a victim unless something has happened to you. Listen here, Pocahontas, it's a miracle you can give tribes any funding at all. All of us here in D.C. worked hard in 94 to get the Violence Against Women Act passed. We didn't have to ask for funding for tribal DV programs, but we did. You should be thankful for what you have. Nettie enters. She packs up the few remaining items in the Imanic Women's Shelter. Leonora Hooch opened the shelter in Imanic 27 years ago. It's our only shelter for Native women in the entire state of Alaska. When we opened, our women had nowhere else to go. We find them hiding in smokehouses, in the steam house, our in boats. Our villages are so remote. Where I live in Tetlin, there, there are no roads. The only way is to come and go is by plane or in the warmer months, a boat. Our, now, <laughs> they tell us our tribes have no jurisdiction that we can't exercise any kind of authority. But when we call the state troopers for help, it takes two or three days for them to arrive, if they come at all. Why did the federal government take away our jurisdictions? and given it to men who don't come at all. For three decades, this shelter has been the only place women can go if they can make it. We've seen a lot of women come in and out of this door. Now we have to close it. Very interesting. State cut our funding. Our only shelter in the whole state of Alaska that serves Native women, and they refuse to fund us. Terry has many is packed. What is this? A grant from the DOJ OVW office, enough to keep you open. I just put three mothers on the street. We tell them to come back. One of the women, I had to tell her to leave and her husband just tried to kill her. We'll get a protective order. She has one. The tribe issued it last week. Well, that's great. Alaska refuses to enforce it. How how can they refuse to enforce a protection order? They say we don't have jurisdiction. Nettie exits. Terry starts packing up her desk. What are you doing? What's it look like I'm doing? I'm packing. Did you ask for time off? No. Our reports to Congress is due at the end of the month and I'm going to need you to get on that immediately. I'm not coming back. What? I'm going home to Cherokee. <laughs> I suppose the rats were just too much. I'm done applying Band-Aids. Our Band-Aids make a difference. They provide your people with funding. My people don't need your funding. Tribes do. They want to provide shelter and food and counseling and- We have to do more than just give women counseling. Oh, you're right. Please stand back and let me wave my magic wand and make all of this violence go away. We don't need your magic wand. We need jurisdiction. 
Harry exits, carrying her box of possessions. DOJ woman follows. Diane enters. My people, the Southern Ute, we're the only tribe in Colorado. I've lived my whole life here on our reservation. Our reservation is our land and our jurisdiction comes from the land. Creator place is here. So we've been here since creation and this stripping of our jurisdiction, this taking, it isn't real, but it almost cost me my life. When I was 26 years old, I started dating a non-Indian white man. I was in love and life was wonderful. And after the bliss of dating six months, we were married. He moved into my house and lived with me on my reservation. To my shock, just days after our marriage, he assaulted me. I thought after the first time it wouldn't happen again, but then it happened a second time and a third. So I called for help. And then I called for help again and again. I called so many times, but no one could ever help me. You're so upset. Why don't you make one of your calls? Oh, that's okay, baby. I'll make the call for you. Job police, is this an emergency? Well, not exactly. Can I help you? I, I just want to apologize because you see it. I got a little carried away this morning and well, uh, uh, I hit my wife. Are you enrolled? Mm, I'm white. So you're not enrolled. Is that a problem? You've called before. Yeah. Well, Nothing's changed. Like... If you're not enrolled, we don't have jurisdiction. He says he doesn't have jurisdiction. You want to talk to him? Thanks for your help, officer. When will you finally get it? Do whatever he wants. They can never touch me. Blossom, Yolanda, Pauline, Erlina, Melissa, Deborah, Billy Joe, Lisa, and Nettie enter. I picked up the phone. I made a call. <clears throat> but no one responded. I must have called a hundred times. Please. Can't you do something? The answer was always the same. We can't. He's not enrolled. He's not Indian. We don't have jurisdiction. But I kept calling. I called the police. Please help. Every time. 911. 911. 911. I need your help. But every time I called, no one showed up. They would just write a report. They always let him go. I remember looking at those police reports in eight-point font. Years later, my mom asked me to be her advocate, you know, pull all of my father, stepfather's police records. And there were pages. All of those 911 calls were in eight-point font, individual calls. There would have had to have been at least seven to eight, nine pages. That's how many 911 calls were made for help. And he was never, ever, once, ever convicted for anything he did to her. This isn't just about white people. There are Indians in our communities. Our relatives. Our brothers. Our uncles. Our police officers. We have relatives that abuse our women. We have police officers who kill our children. And we must hold them accountable. But if they're not enrolled, our police can't arrest them. There's nothing we can do. That's my story. He's native. And if you look at him, you would think he's the stereotypical Indian. 
but he's not enrolled. His mother is full blood and his dad is white and his tribe only allows the child of a father to enroll. They can't do anything to me. I'm not enrolled. He would say that all the time. In order for me to feel safe, I had to sell my place and move off the reservation. I had to leave my home. As long as I remained on my reservation, federal law prohibited my tribe from protecting me. It wasn't always this way. There was a time before. Before 1978. A time when we had jurisdiction. Before Oliphant. I remember when I read Oliphant. I couldn't believe it. My dad called. Tribal council convened an emergency meeting. Said, you better read this. The Supreme Court issued a decision. It's going to change our lives. 1978. The Supreme Court said, we can't prosecute non-natives. Non-Indians. Anyone that's not enrolled. The court said, if we can't prosecute them, if they come onto our lands and commit crimes. 1978. 1978. We had a time before in Alaska, before 1998, before the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, before ANGSCA. Before 1978. And a time when we had land. A time when we had jurisdiction. But then the court decided, Vinite. In 1998, the Supreme Court said, we have no Indian country. There's no Indian country left in Alaska because of ANGSCA. But I'm still here. 1978. 1998. My stepfather. My husband. My daughter's boyfriend. He's non-native. Not enrolled. He lives in my village. They come onto our reservation. After Oliphant? After Anska. After Venetai? He began to realize. After Oliphant? After Anska. After Venetai? He figured it out. After Oliphant? After Anska? After Venetai? He knew. It didn't matter if I had bruises. Or cuts. Or bleeding. Or a broken bone. Because of Oliphant. Because of Ainska. Because of Vinatai. He could kill me, and it wouldn't matter. Everyone exits. Chairman enters, followed by Councilwoman and Dennis. They join Terry, who takes his seat. Dennis is standing presenting to a tribal council meeting in Cherokee, North Carolina. OCO, and thank you for having me here today to present. See ya. Sorry? This is Eastern Band, we don't say OCO. You're not in Oklahoma anymore. So how long will this take? Well, with what I'm prepared to present, not more than 40 minutes. Uh... No, I, I mean the campaign. How long will this take to get the bill passed, you know, with the tribal jurisdiction provision? Well, this Congress, who knows? It could take quite a while. Quite a while. Months, years? Nothing's guaranteed. Well, we've been working on this for years. I'm well aware. We sponsored the wiping of the tear ceremony when Senator Biden prepared the draft for VAWA 2005. I remember that. But you think the time is now? We need them to act now. You need them to act now. Oh, this has nothing to do with me. Terry here is co-chair of the NCAI Task Force on Violence Against Women. We're proud of her appointment. It has no effect on my service to council. How it many sure times? It sure does. You're sitting here telling us we ought to advocate for jurisdiction for everyone. Yes. Why should Eastern Band foot the bill for everyone else? Because we all need jurisdiction. Uh, <clears throat> if, if I may interject. Please. I know it's a lot to ask. But you won't be the only one. Sam Manuel stepped up and Chief Anderson has promised the support of the Choctaw. Layla, Cherokee Nation. Muskogee Creek. I believe so. Well, I hope so. We can't do this alone. You won't be. Everyone is helping. We have to stop thinking about this as uh, my tribe and their tribe. 
Divide and conquer has been the other side of philosophies in 1492. Okay, but what are we really facing? I'm not sure I know what you mean. If we put money into this now, what's the chance that this will, that we will actually walk away with jurisdiction? It's going to be difficult. How difficult? Challenging. But not impossible. We couldn't get the Dems to put it in the Law and Order Act just last year. That wasn't a campaign. Well, if we can't win the Dems, we'll never reach the Republicans. This is different. I'm being honest with you, Terry. Councilwoman Henry, to you, Mr. Whitehawk, and let me tell you something about our tribal council. Our tribal council doesn't do things because it's possible. We do things because it's our responsibility to do them. It's our job to protect every man, woman, and child in our community. And we know that if we protect a woman in her home, then we protect her children and that protects her house and the house next to her and the house next to that. And so pretty soon it's the entire community we're able to protect. Yes, but we need to be realistic about what we can do in this. This isn't, this isn't about what we can do. This is about what we should do. And what we should do is fight for this Congress to recognize the inherent sovereignty we have as a tribal government to protect our people. Put it to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Mr. Whitehawk, you're authorized to lobby on behalf of the Eastern Band Cherokees for the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, specifically to advocate for the passage of the proposed tribal jurisdiction provision. Meeting's adjourned, and we'll send you the contract. Thank you. E. Very difficult. This will be difficult. You know what's difficult? Listening to women who've been raped abused and battered, ask you for help and having to tell them there's nothing you can do because you don't have jurisdiction. I know. I was tribal police before I went to law school. Betty, Yolanda, Pauline, Blossom, Erlina, Melissa, Diane, Lisa, and Billy Joe enter. I'd get a call and before I could help her, I'd have to ask. Where is she? Is she on land that is in trust? Or land that's been sold? She could be on fee land. And you can't just ask, where is she? You have to ask, who is he? Is he Indian? Is he enrolled? He's not. The tribal police do not have jurisdiction. Makes you want to never answer the phone. Ladies exit. Will we expect a full court press? You'll get nothing left. Uh, Senator Patrick Leahy enters and joins Terry and Dennis, Washington, D.C., late winter 2012. I'll have my staffer get started on this right away. We really do think now is the time, before this year's election. Right, 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 of course. The Republicans desperately need women voters. We can capitalize on that. Is there someone you can reach out to across the aisle? Yeah, Crapo's agreed to co-sponsor. You're going to give this to a Republican? Mike's good on Indian affairs. Well, yeah, but... Trust me, Dennis. No one's going to listen to a Democrat from Vermont. <laughs> okay. Have my staffer send you a draft of what we put together. And you're serious about this? Are you? Uh... <laughs> Look, you're up here talking to me how your women suffer the highest rates of violence in the United States. They do. How tribes need jurisdiction to protect their women. We do. So where are your tribal leaders? If jurisdiction is so important to them, why aren't they here to talk to me about it? Didn't you tell me the relationship between tribal nations and the federal government is sovereign to sovereign? It is. Look, this is going to be an uphill battle. We can probably get through the Senate, but the House? <sighs> well, uh, let me put it this way. I don't see the path. If you want even the slightest chance of winning, you need to bring your leader and they need to speak directly to Congress. Well, we got the chair of the Judiciary Committee. <laughs> That's a good start. Who are you gonna to talk to next? You and I are scheduled to meet with Senator Cornyn. What? I got us two tickets to DC for Monday. You're gonna walk the halls with me. 
<laughs> I think you're confused. I hired you, not the other way around. <laughs> I'm a lobbyist. I can't do this alone. I need a tribal leader, a representative of one of our sovereign nations to stand there, advocate with me. Okay, but why me? You're a woman? A very busy woman with lots of work to do. You're a tribal leader. I'm no one special. Oh, you're Councilwoman Henry. Please call me Terry. The senator can't meet with you today, so it'll be me today. I'm sorry, you are? Terry Henry. I serve on tribal council for the Eastern Band of Cherokee. She's a co-chair for the National Congress of American Indians Committee on Violence Against Women. Okay. We're here to discuss Lady Crapo. If you've had a chance to read the bill, you can- Look, I, I'm going to stop you right there and be honest with you. We're willing to stay as late as we need tonight to work this out. What's on the table? We'd like to propose some language. We brought our pajamas. I guess I forgot mine. So you, you removed jurisdiction. We replaced it with federal delegation. That won't work. Oh, it has to. Congress needs to restore jurisdiction, not delegate it. Congress can't recognize jurisdiction in Indian tribes. Why not? It's uh, unconstitutional. No, it's pre-constitutional. We existed as sovereign nations before you even had this document you call a constitution. <clears throat> Terry, the Supreme Court was clear in Oliphant. Tribes don't have jurisdiction. I mean over non-natives. You, of course, have jurisdiction over your own people. Just not your people? If this is your attempt to charm the Senate into voting for the bill, you're failing. Uh, we got the votes we need. In the Senate, but not in the House. I'm sorry, does Senator Cornyn get a vote in the House? Look, we're here to negotiate a deal with you. And you want to negotiate with us, so you don't have to negotiate with Cantor. Oh, I'd rather talk to Cantor. <laughs> Fine. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> you might pass the Senate, but you'll never pass the House. <clears throat> we gotta work on tone. Tone? We're asking people to give us something we want. We're asking them to give us what they should have never taken. I agree with that, but it's 2012, not 1877. We have to take what we can get. Yolanda Blossom, Pauline, Erlina, Melissa, Deborah, Lisa, Diane, Nettie, and Billy Joe enter. There was a time. Before now. There was a time. When we were safe. When we didn't have this kind of violence. Not like we do now. Our men knew to view women in a sacred manner. Not to say that we lived in a perfect society. Because we didn't. But we certainly didn't live in a society where women are treated like this. It was never like this. They introduced it. When the soldiers came to round us up. To send us on the trail of tears. When they first put us on the reservation. When they forced us to go to their schools. We had to hide. We had to hide. We, we had, had to go to, to a fort. We, we had, had to, to hide. To fort. We had to get our food. We had to get our rations. Our commodities. From the soldiers. And when we went to the fort to get our food. Man and woman enter. It is the 19th century on a reservation in the Great Plains. Woman approaches man and hands him her card. What is this? I, I've come for my rations. Well, we're all out. Please, sir, I have children. I said we're all out. I have to feed my children. Come in the back. Are you deaf? I said come in the back. You don't get something for nothing around here. You want to feed your children? Come in the back. Man takes woman's arm and leads her off stage. My grandmother. My grandmother. Our grandmothers. They, they were, were raped. They were raped. They were raped. They were, they raped. were raped. 
by the government agent. For food. To feed their children. Raped by the soldiers. Just because they could. They had to run. They had to hide. They had no choice. Our grandmothers. My grandmother. They're survivors. Survivors of war. They weren't targeted because of the color of their skin. We aren't targeted because of the color of our skin. We're targeted because of who we are as Indian women. As Native American women. Alaska Native women. Because we're citizens of sovereign nations. Because we're sovereign women. It's been this way for 500 years. Since the Russians came. Since 1492. Since, Since 1978. 1998. I wish I could say the war has ended, but we live in conflict every day. It's time for a change. It's time for it's change. Time it's time for a change. change. All exit. Senator Dean Heller Staffer enters and approaches Terry. I know it's awful, but that's the truth. I had no idea. Uh, Senator Brown, do you have a minute? Uh, this, uh, is coming, this is coming from Crapo. Uh, I'm in a rush. Yes, from Crapo. He's read the bill. I I'd like to talk to you about VAWA. Senator Heller wants you to know. The tribal jurisdiction provision? You have his vote. Thank you. And you have my vote. For Lady Crapo. Yes. Thank you. Senator Susan Collins enters and approaches Dennis. Senator Sen Scott Brown exits. Senator Collins. Do I know you? Dennis Whitehawk. I represent the Eastern Band of Cherokee. John McCain Stauffer enters and approaches Terry. And you want me, well, you want to talk to me about VAWA? Yes. Yes. I spoke to Patty. We have some questions. I liked the answers. The tribal jurisdiction provision is very important. You have my vote. Thank you. Senator Tim McCain agrees. Great. You have his vote. Thank you. But he doesn't think you'll pass the House. Senator Olympia Snow enters. Senator Snow. We'd like to discuss VAWA. Sure. Uh, jurisdiction is critical. Without it, you have my vote. Thank you. And the vote of every Republican woman in the Senate. Well, <laughs> that's great. You look surprised. We just, I get, well, I, I you, didn't expect. You didn't think that a bunch of Republicans would support you on this. Let me tell you something. We may be Republicans. But first and foremost, we are women. <laughs> That's a lot of Republicans. <laughs> no. I talked to Brown. I spoke to Snow. McCain staffer. And, and Heller. They said yes. We might have enough votes. Senator Moran staffer enters and approaches Terry. Uh, Senator Moran wanted me to tell you. Senator DeMarco Rubio enters and approaches Dennis. No. Well, Senator Rubio, with all due respect. He, he can't vote for this. You won't change my mind. Did he say why? If you can't negotiate with Cornyn, you can't negotiate with him. Senator Mike Lee enters and approaches uh, Dennis. Uh, let me get this straight. Big government and inefficiency. The tribal jurisdiction provision restores jurisdiction at the local level. Nah, I'm sorry. You're taking authority away from the state. I don't believe this. And giving it to the feds? That's not at all what we're doing. Oh, I read the bill. Senator Shelby Stauffer enters and approaches Terry. Senator, Senator Shelby, Shelby wanted me to tell you. McCain's voting for it. I'm Senator Lee, not McCain. His vote is no. Does he understand that? What... I'm late for a meeting. 
Senator uh, Pat Toomey enters and approaches Dennis. Senator, Senator Toomey. Senator Toomey, I'd like to talk to you about VAWA. Oh. I have a meeting with Senator Wicker. He's not here. The travel jurisdiction provision is very important. I understand your position, but... When will he be back? I've made up my mind. We said we would discuss VAWA. Well, I discussed it with him. My vote is no. And Senator Wicker is against it. Seriously? I'm sorry, I can't help you. But we just don't agree here. Thank you for your time. Both Kim Fee. Well, where's the White House? Fully on board. Oh, that's great. Like he says they're voting next week. Do we have enough votes? I don't know. Lord, we don't. Senator Patty Murray and Deborah enter. Senator Murray. I hear what you're saying. We have a right to this water. Everyone says they have the right to the water. Yes, but this water is ours. We signed a treaty with you, your government. Let me see what I can do. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, uh, one more thing. Yeah. VAWA. Okay. I need to be honest with you. Uh, Sean, I need you to tell Deborah everything you told me. Everything. Votes like that happen in the next day or so. Oh, that's great. The tribal jurisdiction provision won't be in it. What? It's been taken out. What about the immigrant provision? It's still in there. LGBTQ? Still in. You realize we have tribal members who are LGBTQ? Yeah, sure. <laughs> they won't be protected without jurisdiction. VAWA will do nothing to protect them on tribal lands. Don't have the votes. If we fight for tribal jurisdiction now, we'll lose the whole thing. We can't afford to lose the entire VAWA. What about my women? My citizens, the women that I represent? We're so oh, sorry. We wrote letters. We came here to speak. It's been decided. There must be something we can do. I could hold a press conference. Well, you think that would make a difference? I it would if you agreed to speak. I'm not a policy analyst. You're a tribal leader. Yes, but... Uh, you could share your story. You don't know my story. But you have one. You're in here talking to me about your treaty rights. Isn't that what VAWA is all about? The next morning. Everyone is gathered for the press conference held by Senators Murray, Boxer, and Klobuchar. Senator Murray stands at the podium next to Deborah. Yolanda, Pauline, Erlina, Blossom, Lisa, Melissa, Nettie, Diane, and Billy Joe enter and stand in silent support. It's really my honor to introduce to you Vice Councilwoman Deborah Parker very courageous in coming forward today to talk personally about why this is so very important to her and so many other Native American women. Thank you, Senator Murray, Senator Boxer, and Senator Klobuchar. Good morning. My name is Deborah Parker. I'm an enrolled member of the Tulalip tribes of the state of Washington, where I currently serve as the vice chair of the tribe. Yesterday, I shared with Senator Murray the reasons why the Violence Against Women Act is so important to our Native American women. I did not expect to be sharing my own story. I am a Native American statistic. I'm a survivor of sexual and physical violence. My story starts in the 70s as a toddler. You may wonder how I remember when this occurred. I was the size of a couch cushion, a, a red velvet, approximately two and a half feet couch cushion. One of the many girls violated an attack by a man that had no boundaries or regards for a little child's life or my life. 
The man responsible was never convicted. In the early 80s, at a young age, I was asked to babysit my auntie's children. During the late hours of the evening, she arrived, but was not alone. Instead of packing my things to go home, my sense was to quickly grab the children. The four or five men that followed my auntie home raped her. I had to protect the children and hide. I could not save my auntie. I only heard her cries. Today is the first time that I've ever shared this story. She died at a young age. Perpetrators were never prosecuted. A majority of our girls have struggled with sexual and domestic violence, not once, but repeatedly. My question for Congress was and has always been, why did you not protect me? Why did you not protect my family? My auntie. My mother. My daughter. My granddaughter. Me. I am urging Congress to uphold the U.S. Constitution. Honor our treaty agreements. Recognize our sovereignty. Restore our jurisdiction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All except Deborah Exit, who remains. She sits at a desk hard at work. Dennis enters. What do you need, Deb? Need? You had anything to eat? Oh, I'm fine. You've been at it for days now. I haven't seen either thing. I'm not hungry. Well, brought your sandwich. Okay, what, what do you think of this sentence? The tribal jurisdiction provision in the reauthorization of VAWA 2013 recognizes the rights of our Native women to be free of violence and abuse as well as the inherent sovereign authority of tribes to protect their own citizens. Sounds good to me. It's too many commas. I think it's fine. No, people stop listening when you use too many commas. I don't think people hear commas. I hear commas. I hear commas all the time and they bother me. You're a lawyer. Did you spend years studying where to place commas? <laughs> I was tribal police before law school. We never used commas. Uh, now, my dad, he was obsessed with commas. Whenever he wrote an opinion or an order, he'd spend hours revising, deleting commas, adding commas. He always said judicial orders must command respect. He was a tribal judge. Never got to sleep in on a Saturday morning because he'd drag me out of bed and throw me in the car. He'd take me with him to court. And on the way, he'd make me read. Back then, to have a legal case, it was like a a printout of a book. So we'd drive, and sometimes it was several hours, and he'd say, okay, read this to me. And I'd read the case to him, and he'd say, what do you think that means? And he was teaching me at a very young age to respect the law. I thought about going to law school. Don't. You went? I had to. Your dad made you go? Don't have the TV on? No. What the heck are you doing in here? We were talking. <laughs> Crying out loud, turn on C-SPAN. In a minute, I need to concentrate. They voted. What? We won. Oh my God. We got 68. We just passed the Senate. Oh, thank you. Don't gotta thank me. Oh, okay, we're hugging. <laughs> we won. <laughs> we still had to pass the house. I got to call my husband oh, and my kids. Never <laughs> runs off stage. You didn't think we'd do it. Didn't think we had the votes. We didn't until the last second. Hmm. How long did it take for me to convince you this campaign would be worth it? I didn't need any convincing. You had me at OCO. <laughs> <laughs> Terry exits. Tom Cole enters. Tom, it's good to see you. Congrats on passing the Senate. Thank you. I hear you're representing the Eastern Band. Yes. <laughs> you forget you're from Oklahoma? Oh, don't worry. I still got my twang. Mm, good to hear. <laughs> so, how do we get Leahy Crapo through the house with tribal jurisdiction in it? I'm not sure we can. Not what I wanted to hear. 
Boehner has signed Cantor to VAWA, and he's opposed sovereignty. Based on what? I think the Constitution. Where in the Constitution does it say tribes no longer have jurisdiction? You don't have to convince me. You have to convince Cantor. So, what's he think? It's going to be difficult. But he thinks we can do it. Now, he's a congressman, not a prophet. Someone needs some sleep. Or a Red Bull. We need to go where we're most powerful. Our survivors. Ought to tell survivors she doesn't deserve justice. Our stories are powerful. You think they'd agree? To come up here? Lisa Brunner would. Yes. She oh, stood yes. up and spoke out in 2003 when tribal leadership wanted to ignore this issue. What about Shara Giles? Yes, Shara. Uh, oh, Melissa Merrick. Diane Millich. And our sisters in Alaska. Nettie Warblow. Oh, uh, uh, Lenora Hooch. Shirley Moses. How do we get them here? Let me see what I can do. <sighs> Melissa, Billy Joe, Diane, Nettie, and Lisa enter. Deborah joins them. At first, I wasn't sure. What would my family think of me? What would my tribe think of me? Why me? Shouldn't they be asking someone else? And so when she asked me... When Terry said... Will you come to D.C.? Will you speak out? I really had to think if that was going to be right for me. Would I be comfortable doing that? I was mainly thinking about my three daughters, especially my youngest one. She had no idea that I'd ever had to live my life in such a way. Maybe she's seen these kinds of things on TV or in movies, but she doesn't know that these things happen in real life to real people, people that she knows. I wanted to protect her. Shield her. I didn't want her to know. But I can't shield her from everything. She's already dating. She could end up in a relationship with a young man who's not enrolled. A non-Indian. And if he were to mistreat her, would I be okay knowing that I didn't do whatever I could to help keep her safe? No. So I said yes. I agreed to go I to D.C. Yes. I agreed to share my story. But I was diagnosed with lupus last week and started chemotherapy in just a few days. Diane, I don't know what to say. I, I'm not asking for sympathy. But if you can't come. I'm coming. I have a serious illness, but this is important. Thank you. This will make a difference for all Native women. I never told Terry this, but I didn't agree to share my story for her or even for the other women. I did this for my family. I did this for my auntie. I did this for the next generation. I did this for my daughter. My daughter was raped last summer. Even though they wore bandanas, my daughter recognized their white skin and blonde hair. They were doing what I call hunting on our reservation. Non-natives know they can come onto our lands and rape and abuse our women with impunity. My daughter was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. She didn't come and tell me right away. She washed and she hid it. Last summer, we had another little girl who was raped. Nothing was done. The state did nothing, so she hung herself. Our suicide rate on our reservation is quite huge, as it is in all of Indian country. So my daughter, hearing all of the stories about this little girl being raped and her death, she finally broke and told me what had happened to her. And my daughters know better. They don't go try and party. They know the dangers of our environment, and they know that. And they know that we're a walking bullseye. We're not just a target. We're a walking bullseye. And so she went out in the middle of the night to go and find my niece. 
she didn't want my niece to get into trouble for being out late because she would have. And as my daughter walked down the road, four white guys in a black leather SUV with tan leather interior were trying to get her into the vehicle. And she said no. And she just kept walking. And this is in the biggest town that we have on our reser reservation. Population maybe 1,000. And she's walking and they're getting more persistent. So she takes off running and they chase her down. Two guys jump out of the vehicle, drug her to it. And so one was driving, two held her down, and the fourth one raped her. And they had bandanas on over their eyes and faces, but she's seen their white skin and blonde hair. And when they were done, they threw her out by the bridge. And as a mom, you know, that more than took the wind out of me. That slammed me to the earth with an ungodly speed. And all the measures I had tried to protect her didn't work. My daughter isn't an animal to be hunted. She's a human being. Tom Cole and Cantor enter, the women and Dennis exit. Well, if it isn't the gentleman from Oklahoma. <laughs> I hope I'm not intruding. No, no, no. My three o'clock was counting. Sit down. I won't be long. Uh, Val was making me a very popular man. Uh, I got Joe Biden beating down my door, and every woman in the house wants to tell me what she thinks. They're in favor. Not all of them. Well, you know where I stand. Yeah, I do, and uh, I wish I could help you, but I got two committee chairmen blocking the Senate bill, and they won't budge. Hastings? Mm. Yeah, well. Now, I'll tell you this. If you convince Hastings to vote for tribal jurisdiction, I'll send it to the floor. Well, you and I both know that that will never happen. Mm. Well, feel free to come back to me if it does. <laughs> Cantor enters his Cantor's. Room. Sorry. No. Go ahead. Excuse me. <sighs> Cantor's bill removes jurisdiction and replaces it with federal delegation. And that won't work. But it will pass. What if you drafted a bill? Me? You're a popular guy. People take you seriously. Not on Indian issues. Folks will say, well, that's just another one of Tom Cole's Indian bills. I disagree. If I draft the bill, it'll be dead in the water. We don't have a lot of options here. It's not like I can ask a Democrat to draft this. Ask Isa. Daryl Isa? He's Lebanese, not Chickasaw. That's yeah, like a whole different tribe. Seriously, why is it? He's a strong supporter of the tribes, and he's the chair of the oversight committee. But that committee has nothing to do with this. Exactly. That committee exists purely to torture the president. He's overseeing all the investigations that look into Obama, including Benghazi. So we've got to we've got ourselves a bona fide respect Republican partisan. Daryl Issa's name is first on the bill, folks. We'll look at it. Okay, fine. Uh, could you just check with him, see if he'd be willing to do it? I already did. He said yes. Tom Cole and Dennis exit. Deborah and Patty Murray enter. Do you have a nice Christmas? Hmm. Hard to believe it's 2013. Time goes by fast around here. I didn't go home for the holidays, just stayed here and worked straight through. I figure I'll go home and see my kids after we win in the house. There'll be plenty of time for family when we win. Cantor refused to put it to vote. What? He let the bill expire. The bill's dead? 
We'll reintroduce it. Leahy already has a draft going. What good will that do? If we can pass it before the end of January, it'll be back on the House by the 1st of February. We could pass it in the Senate every year for 50 years. That won't get it through the House. I know you're disappointed. I'm going home. Deborah. I haven't seen my kids in three months. This isn't defeat. What do I tell my tribe? I haven't been to a council meeting in months, and now, now I'm going to lose my reelection. You tell them that Patty Murray says one month from now, we'll have VAWA 2013 passed in the Senate. And then what? You have momentum. Don't stop now. I'm calling Dennis Enter as Deborah and Senator Murray exit. Murray and Leahy think they can have a vote by the end of January. That's fast. They have the vote. And we don't. Tell them to slow down. We have momentum. 90 miles an hour down a dead-end road gets you nowhere. <laughs> we just have to convince Canner to put it to a vote. And he's convinced it's unconstitutional. What's unconstitutional about recognizing a tribe's sovereignty? Jurisdiction. All the things. Are you kidding me? Have you read all the fun? A hundred times. And it still doesn't make sense to me. How do you explain the court's decision that after hundreds of years of sovereign existence, a sovereign existence that predates the United States Constitution, that all of a sudden in 1978, tribal governments lost their sovereignty? Poof. <laughs> I guess it disappeared. I used to watch my dad preside over tribal court. My great-grandfather was the clerk of our Chickasaw Supreme Court. We prosecuted everyone. Indian, non-Indian, black, white, French, Chinese, didn't matter. And if you committed a crime on the reservation, the tribe could prosecute you. When I was in college, my sister, Rachel, she was working at the casino over in Red Rock. This guy, when my sister finished her shift, he followed her into the parking lot. And he raped her. When he was done with her, he left her on the ground and drove off. But she saw his license plate. Joseph Jefferson, 34-year-old white male, chemical engineer, living in Nichols Hill. He got his license plate. Ask your sister to speak. Congress needs to hear her story. She killed herself. Six months after the rape, when we figured out our tribe didn't have jurisdiction to prosecute him, we came back to the casino and started stalking her. Father enters. Did you just get accept this? What do you want me to do? Prosecute this man. You're a judge. Issue an order. Have the police arrest him. I can't. We have his license plate. Dennis. We know his name, where he works. We know where he lives. He's non-Indian. We don't have jurisdiction. Father hands Dennis a printed copy of the Oliphant decision in a printed hardbound reporter volume. Read it. I'm not, a, I'm not a lawyer. I said read it. We granted Sir, Sir, Sir Tot, Sir. <laughs> Sir Shiari. Yeah, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Read the full sentence. We granted Sirshiari to decide whether Indian tribal courts have criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. We decide we decide that they do not. What do you think that means? Father exits. Man, I had to go to law school. <laughs> Tom Cole picks up a book off of his desk containing a printed copy of the Oliphant decision. You read the entire opinion. Yeah, my dad made me. Read the last sentence. Finally, we are not unaware of the prevalence of non-Indian crime on today's reservations, which the tribe forcefully argue requires the ability to try non-Indians. These are considerations for Congress to weigh in deciding whether Indian tribes should be authorized to try non-Indians. What do you think that means? Congress has the constitutional power to restore the inherent jurisdiction of Indian tribes. You go back and tell Patty Murray that if she and Leahy can get through the Senate, I'll do whatever the hell it takes to pass the House. 
Tom Cole exits. Deborah and Terry enter. Leahy's reintroducing the bill on Monday. Murray thinks they'll have it passed by February 1st. Is that a bit fast? She thinks we have momentum. But we need buzz in the press. I know a reporter at the Times. Would he be willing to write about Bawa? <laughs> Maybe you could ask her. Uh, Dennis smiles. New York Times enters. Diane enters. Dennis, Terry, and Deborah exit. Ms. Millich, thank you for taking my call. I'm with the, the Times. Yeah, the Aspen Times? The New York Times. Oh. Yeah, Dennis Whitehawk gave me your name. <laughs> He's been doing that a lot lately. Uh, I'm writing an article about the tribal jurisdiction provision in the proposed reauthorization of VAWA. Would you be willing to share your story? I was born on the Southern Ute Reservation. My mother was Southern Ute and my dad was a first generation Yugoslavian. When I was 36, I married a white man, believing he would treat me the same way my father treated my mother. He moved onto my reservation and lived with me there, but we weren't married for very long before he became violent. The brutality increased after I left and filed for a divorce and the order of protection. One day after the Southern Ute Tribal Court awarded my order of protection, I was at work. When I saw him pull up in our red truck, and my ex-husband walked inside our office and told me, you promised me until death do us part, so death it shall be. He was armed with a nine millimeter gun. Not for my very brave coworker, I would not be alive today. My coworker prevented my murder by pushing me out of harm's way. My coworker took the bullet in his shoulder. BIA police and state trooper enter, both carrying measuring tape. As Diane continues her story, they get down on the ground and measure the area from where the gun was fired to where the bullet landed. Now, the shooting took place at a Federal Bureau of Land Management land site where we both worked. The jurisdictional issue was so complicated that after the shooting, my Southern Ute Tribal Police, the Colorado State Patrol, our county sheriffs, the city police, the federal agents, all six agencies were standing there with measuring tapes and maps. I got five. Uh, I got four. <laughs> this is clearly federal. Oh, are you kidding me? Take a look. You're at least, what, uh, six inches away? The bullet, it landed on federal. The gun was fired from the state. Yeah, but where's the body? Not in the state. It took hours just to decide who had jurisdiction. Oh, look, if you want it, take it. Um, we don't want the feds leftovers. No, oh, no, this is small potatoes for the feds. Southern Ute says they want to prosecute. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. They don't have jurisdiction. The district attorney decided that the 6th Judicial District of Colorado would prosecute the case. Defense attorney enters and the state trooper becomes the prosecutor. We'd like to offer a plea agreement. What's on the table? Attempted voluntary manslaughter. How about aggravated driving under revocation? For driving without a license? He didn't have his license when he was arrested. But he tried to kill someone. He's a first-time offender. He has a history of domestic violence. On the reservation. And you and I both know that that doesn't count. Get him for aggravated driving under revocation and you can still look tough. Show you took a stand against someone who put the lives of your police force in danger. No one ever asked me, the victim, what I needed to feel safe. I'm telling you, aggravated driving under revocation and then we all go home happy. Okay. They shake hands and exit. My tribe wanted to prosecute, 
But because of Oliphant, they couldn't. It was like his attempt to shoot me and the shooting of my coworker didn't even happen. In the end, he was right. The law couldn't touch him. He was above the law. Thank you for sharing your story. Now, I was lucky. My coworker saved my life, but not all of us are so fortunate. Many of us are murdered. On some reservations, Native women and girls are murdered at 10 times the national homicide rate. And when someone takes the life of a Native woman or a girl, no one investigates. That's the story of my granddaughter, Pesera. In August of 2019, she had just graduated from high school. She had landed an audition with an independent film in Hollywood. She had just turned 18 and the world was in front of her. I'm a citizen of the Northern Cheyenne tribe, as is my son. Hey, Sarah is Crow. She was enrolled in her mother's tribe, but she lived with me for much of her childhood and I was her legal guardian. That August, she went up to Crow Fair as she always does, to stay with her mother's family where they camp. But this year, Crow Fair was different. This year, Tessera's younger brother, Asias, was beaten by B BIA police. The BIA arrested Asias, but when I went to pick him up, they had dropped the charges. One of the kids videotaped the BIA officers beating Asias and the video ended up going viral. Just a few days later, Sarah went missing. She was at a friend's house one night, but then didn't come home. One of her aunties on her mother's side went to the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office to report her as a missing person, but it was clear they weren't going to look for her. Then, on August 29th, we heard that the elementary school principal, Jason Cummings, had discovered the body of a young female on his morning jog at the corner of Mitchell and Rangeview. It's a very busy intersection in Hardin. I immediately went to ask if that could be her. Is that the young female you found at Mitchell and Rangeview? Could that, is that Cassara? Huh? I'm asking if you found my granddaughter. Who? Okay, Sarah stops pretty places. Is that her? Oh, uh, we haven't found your granddaughter. So the body you found, that was somebody else. We'll let you know if we find her. So we continued our search. We combed the neighborhood she was last seen in, the very same neighborhood where they had found the unidentified body on the 29th. For almost two weeks, we waited for answers. And finally, on September 11th, the sheriff's office asked to speak with us. We, uh, we found you, Sarah. Where? On the corner of Mitchell and Rangeview. Where you found the other body on August 29th. That was her body. You found her two weeks ago, and you're now just telling us? We weren't sure it was her. What do you mean? She was wearing the same clothes we said she was wearing in our missing persons report. You entered her in the missing persons database, yes? Oh, I'm not here to be interrogated. I, I just want you to help with this investigation. Investigation? We want to help find who killed her. Oh, she wasn't murdered. How can you say that? Well, well, native kids around here, they do too many drugs. There are consequences to partying. I demanded to see the autopsy, but the sheriff's office wouldn't share it with me because it was still in open investigation, even though they weren't actually investigating. 
So I got the county attorney to share it with me. The toxology report showed that Kaysera had no drugs in her system. It's impossible to die from a drug overdose when you have no drugs in your system. I spoke to some eyewitnesses who saw her running down Rangeview at 2 a.m., yelling and being chased the night she went missing. I shared this with the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office and suggested that they interview these eyewitnesses. But they wouldn't. They never did. After I confronted them about the autopsy, they changed their cause of death from drug overdose to natural causes. According to Bighorn County, Kaysera lay down in a suburban backyard at the corner of a busy intersection and just happened to lay there unnoticed for five days until Jason Cummings finally noticed her on his morning run. But there's no way her body was at the corner of that busy intersection for five days. We checked there. We were looking for her. And if she had been there the whole time, we would have seen her. Someone dumped her body there days after they killed her. And since Big Horn County refused to do anything, so we went to the FBI. We don't have jurisdiction. How can you say that? Her body wasn't found on a reservation. Her body was found 300 yards from the border of the Crow Reservation. Yep. There's a chance she was murdered on the reservation, and then her body was just jumped off, dumped off the border. We don't have proof of that. Because you won't investigate. How can you expect to have facts to support your jurisdiction if you don't investigate what actually happened? You know as well as I do that these Native kids party a lot. The autopsy shows shows definitely she did not die from a drug or alcohol overdose. Someone murdered her. Stop blaming the victim and do your job. Her body was found off the reservation. We don't have jurisdiction. They know that. The people who kill our girls know that. They know if they kill them on the reservation, the tribes can't prosecute because of the court's decision in Aliphant. And if they dump the bodies off the border of the reservation, the corrupt county won't investigate. And the FBI, well, it doesn't have jurisdiction. The killers know what they are doing. And the United States is just letting this happen. Hey, Sarah stops pretty places. My granddaughter deserves justice. Dennis, Deborah, and Terry enter. We passed the Senate. I knew we would. We got 78. That's 10 more than last year. 10 Republicans switched over. That's amazing. Diane's story in the Times. It was powerful. That's where those 10 votes came from. So now we just need to win in the House. Oh, Lord save us. Oh. <laughs> I need some caffeine. I got coffee. Oh, Dennis doesn't drink coffee. You don't drink coffee? No, that stuff's bad for you. <laughs> I also brought bagels. Dennis doesn't eat bagels. Oh. He only eats that hippie granola stuff. Uh, they're called cliff bars, all right? But they're they're really good for you. No corn syrup, no processed ingredients. He went to law school in Northern California. <laughs> all right, all right. We need to figure out the schedule for the week. One is setting up a meeting with the Black Caucus. Thank God for Gwen Moore. Oh, and you said you'd meet with Pelosi. I did? Yes, we discussed this. Okay, okay. I'll be stalking Kathy McMorris Rogers. Uh, what about Betty McCollum? On my list. I got McHenry and Denham. Paul Cook? Talking to him tomorrow morning. Who's checking in with Isa? Uh, that's me. Don't forget, you've got Cole. Huh, I think he's got me. Well, whatever you Oklahoma boys share, I'm, it's special, I'm sure. <laughs> Who's got the press? Reporter of the New York Times and LA Times enter as Diane, Lisa, Nettie, Melissa, and Billy Joe emerge. Uh, I'm with the Washington Post. The Los Angeles Times. 
Do you have a minute? Yes. I read Diane Milich's story. It's powerful. I'd like to hear yours. And why are you here? To speak out. To share my story. To stop the silence. Why are you advocating for jurisdiction? One out of three Native women will be raped in her lifetime. 60% of Native women will be assaulted in their lifetime. Alaska Native women experience the highest rates of violence in the United States. Our women, our children, we're not safe. <clears throat> what happened? My husband tried to shoot me. He threatened to drown me. He said he would kill me. My coworker took the bullet in his shoulder. Unbelievable. The majority of violent crimes committed against Native women are committed by non-Natives. They come to our reservation because they know they can abuse women. They know they are safe. They're protected. By the law. By the Supreme Court's decision in Vinatai. Did you call Did the you call the police? Doesn't help. They can't do anything. They don't have jurisdiction. On your reservation? According to the Supreme Court. Because I am a Native woman living on my tribe's lands. Because we have no Indian country. The law won't protect me. What kind of message does that send to our women? I know what kind of message it sent to me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I don't understand. If the violence is so bad. If you aren't safe on your reservation. If he lives in your home and. And your home is dangerous. Why, don't, Why you don't you leave? Wouldn't the laws of the state protect you if you leave your reservation? My great-great-grandfather was Wyagadoga, or Standing Wolf. During the time of the removal, the soldiers came to take him and his family to force them to walk the Trail of Tears. At the time, a white man named George Hayes was living among the Cherokee people. My grandfather asked Hayes what he could do to avoid going west and to be allowed to remain in his homeland. Hayes advised him to save up all his food rations and when he saw the opportunity to break away and make his way back home. But to be caught escaping meant severe punishment or even death. One day, Several weeks later, Hayes was working out in the yard when he saw a small group of people approaching on the horizon. It was Standing Wolf, his wife, and several other Cherokees. His wife held a small newborn baby. Standing Wolf told George Hayes that his new son was named Waya Uchanti, or Comeback Wolf, because the only wish in their hearts at that time was to come back home to these mountains. This is the story of why I and my ancestors before me came to be here in these mountains. Our Cherokee elders tell us that we've always been here. We will always be here. It's believed that we were given our home here in these mountains in Western North Carolina by Creator. And since it was Creator who gave it to us, only Creator can take it from us. So did I ever think of leaving Cherokee? No. Not once. Never. This is my home. This is my home. This is my home. This is my home. I will never leave my home. Berlina enters. Halloween is always hard for me. My daughter was murdered on Halloween. She was murdered on the Blackfeet Reservation. Everyone knows who murdered her. There's no doubt. We have eyewitnesses. On October 31st, 2018, Lindsay and another Blackfeet woman Amy Whitegrass were riding in a car with two teenagers, Sandro Rodriguez and Ernesto Lopez. When 
they stopped the car and one of the boys shot Amy point blank in the head. When Lindsay attempted to prevent them from driving away, they brutally hit and killed her with the vehicle and drove away. The two teenagers fled to Great Falls, Montana, where they were arrested, when the police officers found Amy's body shot through the head in the back of their car. The FBI could have investigated, but they chose not to. For years, I begged the FBI to investigate, but they never interviewed eyewitnesses. They chose not to collect evidence. I asked the United States Attorney's Office in Montana if they would prosecute these two teenagers for the murders they committed against Lindsay and Amy. And the U.S. Attorney said no. He can't bring charges against defendants unless he has evidence in a case file. When I asked why there was no evidence in Lindsay's case file, he said it was because the FBI never investigated. The FBI never spoke to us, but one day they showed up where my son, Lindsay's brother worked. Yes, an FBI. Can I help you? Uh, I'm with the FBI. Is this about my sister? Yes. Thank God. You know, we've been waiting years for you all to investigate. My mom's written letters, we have eyewitnesses. Everyone knows it was Rodriguez and Lopez who ran over and killed Lindsay. Hell, they showed up in Great Falls with Amy's dead body in the back seat. FBI hands Jess a bag. What's this? Your sister's clothing from the day she died. Why are you giving this to me? The investigation is closed. Closed? There's nothing more to investigate. You can't close her case. My sister deserves justice. Have a great day. FBI exits. Just exits. The Blackfeet Nation could not prosecute because Rodriguez and Lopez are not Indian. They're not enrolled citizens of a tribal nation. So, because of the Supreme Court's decision in Oliphant, my tribal nation had no jurisdiction to prosecute the individuals who killed my daughter. The FBI could have, but they chose not to. Lindsay Whiteman. That is my daughter's name. My daughter deserves justice. And I won't stop fighting until justice is served. Erlina and Jess exit as Tom Cole and Kathy McMorris Rogers, Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers, enter. Kathy McMorris Rogers, didn't expect to see you today. I'm on my way to ENC. Thanks for stopping by. Believe me, I'd rather be here sitting with you than sitting in committee. Well, what can I do for you? I, I met with some of the women and I heard their stories. They're powerful. How do we get vowel passed? It's up to Cantor. I mean, how do we convince him to put jurisdiction to a vote? I've tried. He's stubborn as hell. <laughs> I'm sure it'd help if he heard it from you directly. Let me see what I can do. Representative Rogers nods and as Tom Cole and Cantor enter. Oh, I think I know what you're here to discuss. Then let's discuss it. I'm not putting it to a vote. Did you read the New York Times article? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I have standards. <laughs> I hate the press as much as you do. You're the one quoting it. This? is about perception. 53% of voters in the last election were women. Exit polls show that Obama held a 10 point gender gap over Romney. I've heard the numbers. 
if you refuse to put VAWA to a vote now, like you did last year, there will be consequences for all of us. Kathy Rogers exits. Tom Cole enters. Cantor approaches him. Yeah, uh, I'm here because I don't want to have this conversation over email. We need a boat. You think you can just pull the camel's nose under the tent? No one's nose is going under any tents. They got your nose, for sure. What's that supposed to mean? You're supposed to be our guy working with them. I think there's been a misunderstanding. Hmm. I'm their guy working with you. My great 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 grandfather was one of the last to travel on the Chickasaw Trail over tears. He was 14 years old. He walked 80 miles. And from 1837 to 1851, the federal government moved everywhere. We lost everything except our sovereignty. And after we got to our new home in Indian Territory, my great-great-grandfather served as the clerk of the Chickasaw Supreme Court. And after him, my great-grandfather served as the last Chickasaw treasurer before Oklahoma became a state. My mother was the first Native American woman ever elected to the state Senate in Oklahoma. I come from a long line of Chickasaw leaders, men and women, who serve not only their sovereign tribal government, but also the state of Oklahoma and the United States. I have a lot of respect for this government, the sovereign government and how it works. And it works because people vote. They vote in the presidential election and in their state elections. And here in the house, we vote. When the bill passes, it passes. When it doesn't get enough votes, it fails. But no one has to guess whether a majority of the citizens' representatives were for or against a bill when there's a vote. That's all we're asking for. And that's all we want. Please, let us have the vote. Senator Cantor exits. They're voting! Melissa, Nettie, Billy, Joe, Lisa, Dennis, Deborah, and Diane enter. They stand with Tom Cole together. I remember where I was. I remember what I was doing. I remember what I was thinking. And I will never forget. I was on the house floor. And my home in Fairfax. On my reservation. In Cherokee. In Alaska. To Laylip. Watching CNN. C-SPAN. Facebook. Watching the vote. Working for votes. I couldn't breathe. I was so nervous. All I could do was pray. What's the vote? 30. You got 30? Need 218. Congressman enters and passes by Tom Cole. We need your vote. You got my vote. Oh, 31. Thank you. 62. My whole life. I've dreamed of this. 85. I prayed for this. 114. Congresswoman enters and passes by Tom Cole. You got my vote, Tom. Thank you. 115. Everything depends on this. What if we lose? We can't lose. Not an option. 201. 201. Oh my God. I, 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 can't, I can't believe it. 215. <laughs> Holy smokes. 216. We got this. 217. Is this, this is for, real? for real? 218. <laughs> we did it. 218. 218. <laughs> They're still coming. More votes. 235. <laughs> 250. 285. 286. 286. 286. 286. 286. 286. <laughs> 286 oh, votes. Oh, it didn't feel real. I had to call Jax. <laughs> Harry texted me. I just started texting. I started crying. I could hardly see who I was texting. I was crying so hard. I had to scream. I scared my neighbor. I did a victory dance. <laughs> I prayed for my sisters. It just seemed unreal. 
<laughs> it felt like a dream. It was amazing. It was humbling. It was a miracle. Awesome, Yolanda, Pauline, and Erlina enter. But it doesn't cover what happened to my son. It won't save my daughter. It didn't protect Kaysera. It didn't prevent Lindsay's death. VAWA 2013 was not a full Oliphant fix. We need a full Oliphant fix. But we also need to hold our own tribal law enforcement and the BIA police accountable for their actions when they caused the deaths of our children. On November 24th, 2020, my son was chased in a high-speed chase and it was chased in a high-speed chase by Crow police on the Crow reservation when my son crashed his car into a train. BIA police arrived at the scene and told me that, told me and my family that my son died on impact. But then eyewitnesses began to reach out to us. Several people drove by the scene of the crash and saw Braven lying on the road crying for help. One eyewitness told me that my baby begged for help for 30 minutes until he finally died. The BIA refused to share anything with me. They have the police report, but they won't share it with me because they claim his death is still an open investigation. They won't tell me why he was being chased or who exactly was chasing him. What I do know is is that an ambulance was initially called for my son, but then the BIA called the hospital that was dispensing the ambulance and canceled it. Why would they cancel an ambulance? Why was I told by the BIA that Braven died on impact, but then so many eyewitnesses who drove by saw him crying for help for 30 minutes? By the side of the road. The BIA is supposed to pr protect us, not kill us. I found an attorney to help me fight for justice for my son. And she, that we asked Secretary Holland's missing and murdered unit to look into the death of my son. So she wrote a letter, a letter to them asking the MMU to investigate the cause of death. And they told us they don't have the authority to do that because he died under the color of law. And the only FBI, and only the FBI can investigate the death of a person in the hands of law enforcement. So my attorney called the FBI office in Billings. Native woman attorney enters calling the FBI office in Billings. FBI Billings office. <clears throat> I, um, I'm the attorney representing Braven Glenn's family and the MMU referred us to you. Uh, the MMU referred you. We asked the MMU to look into Braven's death and they informed us that the case was transferred to the FBI. Uh, well, it wasn't. Oh, well, I, I apologize if there's been some confusion. Just so I understand, are you at all familiar with this case? I heard about it, but the case hasn't been referred to us. Okay, so it's still with the MMU. The MMU can't investigate. The FBI handles all deaths related to law enforcement. So will the FBI investigate? Lady, we don't investigate cases because attorneys tell us we have to. That's not how the FBI works. Um, I'm not telling you that you have to. I'm just trying to figure out what's happening with Braven's case and the MMU referred us to you. They, they shouldn't have. We haven't decided yet whether we will investigate and I'm not about to make any attorney any promises. Will you at least agree to speak to Braven's mother? Why? She has information on eyewitnesses who watched BIA police stand there and do nothing while her son died. Was she there when he died? No. So she's not an eyewitness? She knows several eyewitnesses. I only talk to eyewitnesses. Do you, 
do you have children? I'm not going to share details about my personal life with you. Can you imagine what it would feel like to be a parent of a child who was killed in the hands of law enforcement only to have the FBI refuse to speak to you? Your woke political BS doesn't mean anything to me. The FBI doesn't investigate cases because a political movement tells us we have to. And I've been here long enough to know that when a native kid dies in the hands of law enforcement on the res, it's not law enforcement's fault. The FBI has refused to speak with, has refused to speak to me. Secretary Holland's MMU says they won't help me, and the BIA says Braven's case is still under investigation. But the FBI says there's nothing to investigate. All I know is that here in Montana, the BIA is corrupt. BIA, BIA officers beat our children, rape our women, and the federal government, the United States, and the Department of the Interior let them without consequence. My son's name is Braven. 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 Please remember him. He deserves justice. My daughter was murdered here in Bighorn County. Just like all the other homicides of our native relatives, her case was never investigated. Bighorn County said that she committed suicide. My daughter was a mother, a mother of four. She would have never, ever left those babies behind. Was it her boyfriend? Probably. He's a white guy and he beat her a lot in the months leading up to her death. One time they were staying at my other daughter's apartment on the Cheyenne reservation. BIA police were called because he beat Allison so bad that the apartment was covered in blood. Officer showed up, took a bunch of photos of the blood and the destruction in the apartment and said he would do something about it. And later on, after Allison was murdered, we called the BIA and we asked for the photos. We wanted to give them to the Bighorn, to Bighorn County. That was in the hopes that they would investigate whether her boyfriend killed her. But the BIA said, that they lost the photos. Somehow they disappeared. Allison was murdered in a motel room in Hardin on February 23rd, 2015. There was a fire in the room and Bighorn County told us that she set the fire herself, that it was a suicide. But the coroner told us the day after she was killed that the motel had security camera footage that shows her boyfriend leaving the motel room right when the fire was started. <clears throat> I asked the motel, they said that they gave the footage to the Bighorn County Sheriff's Office. But when I asked the Sheriff's Office about the footage, they said that no such footage ever existed, that someone had destroyed it. They're claiming Allison committed suicide, but the coroner found markings of a beating on her body. There was a boot mark on her face. How could she have done that to herself? She also had injuries to her wrists that were indicative of restraints. She was likely tied up just before her death. For years, I begged the sheriff's office to investigate her murder. And for years, they did nothing. So when Secretary Holland announced the creation of her missing and murdered unit, I was hopeful. Finally, someone was going to do something. So you'll investigate Allison's case. I can't make any promises. But that's why the MMU was created, yes? to investigate the cold cases of Native women that local authorities have refused to investigate? We can't investigate Allison's case unless Bighorn County gives us permission to investigate. Permission? Well, we need Bighorn County to consent. They won't. 
The guy who killed Allison is tight with the sheriff. His dad is the, the fire marshal. They're never going to consent to anyone investigating how Allison was murdered. I'm sure your attorney can explain to you, but the, the problem is we don't have jurisdiction. Allison died off the reservation. By less than a mile. And she was abused and beaten routinely by her boyfriend on the reservation before he killed her. Could, could you at least look into that? We understand that losing a loved one is a very difficult experience. Yes. Grief can be overwhelming. I live with grief every day of my life. We offer counseling services every day. I don't day. need counseling. We have resources to help you process the pain. I need justice for my daughter. We'll ask Bighorn County for permission. They're not going to give in. The state has jurisdiction over your daughter's death. But the state will never do anything. Just the same. This is up to the state. My daughter. My granddaughter. My son. Was murdered. Was the murdered. Investigate. The FBI won't talk to me. And the MMU says it has no authority. The United States has a trust duty and responsibility to protect the lives of our native women, girls, our boys, and our two spirited relatives. But they're doing nothing. They won't even investigate. VAWA 2013 was a start. It was a step in the right direction. Just this past March in 2022. Congress reauthorized VAWA again. Congress restored tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indian crimes of stalking, stranger sexual assault, child abuse, obstruction of justice, sex trafficking, and assaults on tribal law enforcement. But it's not enough. VAWA 2022 is not a full elephant fix. It does not restore the right of our nations to protect our citizens from murder. Homicide. It doesn't restore the inherent right of the Blackfeet Nation to prosecute the boys who murdered my daughter. In 1978, the Supreme Court took away the right of tribal nations to prosecute non-Indians who commit crimes on tribal lands. And this past June, the court gave that jurisdiction to the states. In a case called Castro Huerta, the court gave criminal jurisdiction to protect Native victims on tribal lands to states. The Supreme Court said that the states have more of a sovereign interest in protecting our children than our own Native nations. That's wrong. Dead wrong. It's dangerous. States don't have a trust duty and responsibility to protect the lives of our women and children. The state has never protected my family. When we call for help, Alaska does nothing. Montana refuses to investigate Allison's murder. Colorado refused to protect my ex-husband, prosecute my ex-husband for attempted murder when he tried to kill me. The court's decision in Castro Huerta places the lives of Native women and children at risk. It undermines the last two reauthorizations of all, where Congress chose to restore tribal jurisdiction to protect Native victims not state jurisdiction. We call on Congress to address the harms of Castro Huerta. We call on Congress to pass a full Oliphant fix. We call on Congress to eliminate the sentencing limitations imposed on tribal nations in the Indian Civil Rights Act. We call on Congress to restrict state jurisdiction on tribal lands absent tribal consent. And we call on the Department of the Interior and the Department of Justice to hold the BIA accountable. When they rape our women. When they beat our children. When they kill our children. They must be held accountable. We will never be able to address the crisis of missing and murdered relatives if a call for help to BIA law enforcement means you will be raped when BIA, BIA officers show up at your house. That's what happened to LB. 
a Cheyenne woman who was raped by the BIA law enforcement in her home when she called them to ask for help. The United States Attorney's Office in Montana, still to this day, is arguing the United States should not be held liable for its officer's rape of LB, a Cheyenne woman in her own home. We have a lot of work to do. Vagwan 2013 is an incredible miracle. It was a step in the right direction. Vawa 2022 restored the right of our tribes in Alaska to protect our women and children in our own homes. What more needs to be done? None of us will be safe until the inherent right of our nations to prosecute all crimes is restored. None of us will be safe until the BIA, DOI, and the FBI are held accountable. The VAWA tribal jurisdiction provision. It's a step in the right direction. It's an enormous victory. But it's just a sliver. The first sliver of restoration. The first sliver sliver of a full moon. moon. The first sliver of a full moon. The first sliver of a full moon. The first sliver of a full moon. First sliver of a full moon. First sliver of a full moon. End of play. Don't go, don't go away yet, Kath. <laughs> don't go away yet. Oh, wow. Thank you. I, and I don't know if any of you all were able to, to uh, get into the chat, but a lot of folks were, were um, <clears throat> in on the chat and talking about their own experiences as well. There were a couple of folks that, um, that shared. Um, well, I would like to um, let all the panelists um, and everyone who's here know a little bit about um, a little bit about the play. Um, the play, Mary Catherine actually sat down with um, with the real people who are are here to tell the stories. Not all of um, not all of the uh, the uh, women who tell their stories in the play are always able to participate, but I would like to especially recognize Melissa and Billy Joe, who played themselves it today and who have, have played themselves many times and told their stories um, over and over again. And I would like to welcome the real Yolanda Frazier here, um, who is gonna be joining us on this panel to talk about um, her granddaughter and um, and uh, what's been happening up um, in their part of the world. But before we do that, I'm just going to ask um, the actors just to introduce themselves because we didn't get a chance to do that. And I'm gonna go in order from my screen. And so I will tell you who's on my screen. So uh, Tamantha, you are first. So would you please introduce yourself and just want everyone to know that this is an all um, uh, American Indian and indigenous cast that we have um, all of our, our cast members are uh, Native American and or indigenous. And so we are very happy to, um, to have that. And to recognize also that Terry Henry is, was in the room with Billy Joe. Um, so the real Terry Henry was there too. And, and we got to, she popped on before the rest of us popped on. So we got to see her and it was, and it was nice. But Tamantha, would you introduce yourself? Thank you, um, Ani Buju. Tamantha Indigenakaz, Makwadoda and Bawating and Donjaba. Hi everyone, uh, I am Tamantha and I'm calling in from Western Massachusetts, the traditional homelands of the Nipmuc people. Okay, thank you, Tamantha. Um, Elizabeth Francis, you're next. Hello, hi, I'm Elizabeth Francis. Um, and I'm just so humbled to be here with you all and to be, uh, to do this play once again. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for hosting and, and the American Bar Association, Mary Catherine, Carolyn, and this whole cast, and all of the, the survivors for sharing their stories. Thank you, Liz. Um, Miss Jane Lind, you are next. So happy to have Jane, Jane with us. <laughs> I am Jane Lind, I am Aleut from the Aleutians, I am Native Alaskan, and uh, 
what an honor it is to be with you. But right now I'm living in Billings, Montana. And um, a story that has to be told. And what an honor again to work with uh, Carolyn and some of the casts here, every one of you, God bless you. And also Mary, it has to be told. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Oh, Shyla Lefner. It's a, a fry bread queen reunion up in here. Yes. yes. Hey, Carolyn. Oh. Uh, hi, my name's Shyla Lefner. I'm Afro Indigenous European of Choctaw, monkey descent. And uh, I'm calling to you, zooming in from uh, Gabrielino Tongva Chumash uh, land, Los Angeles. So happy to be here. Honored. Okay. Oh, Auntie Sarah D'Angelo. Thank you, Carolyn. Sego, everyone. I'm Sarah D'Angelo. I'm calling in from Narragansett Homelands. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for sharing your voices. Thank you so much, Mary Catherine, for writing this story. And it's been an honor to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Melissa Merrick Brady. I had to get all your names in there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I didn't so get I'm all Melissa of them. Brady. A couple of them. Uh, uh, formerly Melissa Merrick, Melissa Brady. Now I'm um, I'm here at the satellite office of the Mandan Hidatsa Rikra Nation in Bismarck, North Dakota. I am a member of the MHA Nation and descendant of Spirit Lake Dakota. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Jeremy Sheldon. Turn on your microphone though. Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> Again, what can I say? I'm so incredibly humbled to be here. I just love every one of you. Every one of your stories has a special place in my heart and it means the world to me to be able to be a part of it. You know, uh, I'm, I'm Cherokee Indian and uh, Athabascan as well. Uh, and, uh, and Eddie. And, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it, my, my grand, my grandmothers, they, they had a lot of struggles that are very similar to these stories. And, uh, uh so I carry them with me whenever I'm doing this work here. And, uh, you know, I, I think about them and it, you know, helps me stay in touch with them and, 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 and fight for their future generations that, you know, that it just, you know, they, they need to have the same chances. And so, you know, any opportunity I can uh, to be here amongst you and 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 helping this cause is just uh, makes it all just worth it. Thank you, Nick Dalton. Hey y'all, uh, my common name is Nick Dalton. Uh, I'm Creek and Cherokee, and I am calling you from Calusa territory in southern Florida. They broke the Spanish mission project. Um, single-handedly, um, and I'm honored. Uh, I have two boys, seemingly TBD, and my brother has two girls. And um, I spent a lot of time talking with them this week, and I'm just really honored to be here. Nick, love you, um, Miss Anabe Greenwood. Ah, Wakanda Wakinami, Juere New Tachineki. Um, I am Anave Greenwood. I am Ota, Missouri, and I'm from Edmond, Oklahoma. Uh, I'm very grateful to be a part of this uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's a very impactful story, and I'm glad that I've got to do it with you guys and to share the story as well. Thank you. Jason Grazel. Okay, hello everyone. Jason Grazel, uh, Blackfeet. Um, I, yeah, just as always, so honored to be part of uh, bringing awareness in these stories. Thank you, Jay. Miss Kimberly Guerrero. All right, Silicut. Hello, relatives. Lim Lim, thank you um, for bringing this ceremony to us today and honoring all of those that we said their names and all of those that we didn't, um, all of our missing and murdered mm -hmm. Indigenous relatives um, that are living both in this time that we're living in this time, but also all the way back um, as, as Mary Catherine's beautiful play mentions 
um, and 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 how it all began um, in 1492. This 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 rash of violence. Um, I'm representing the Wenatchee and Salish uh, nations, and um, I'm coming to you from Tongva, uh, Gabrielino, Serrano, and Kauai lands. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Oh, my heart, my little baby, Pinocchio Dunn Anderson. <laughs> Holly to everybody. Um, I'm Pinocchio Dunn Anderson. I am enrolled with the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians. I'm also Creek, Cherokee, and I'm forgetting one, Seminole. I haven't said that in a minute. Um, I'm also Afro-Indigenous, uh, pronouns they, them, two-spirit. And I'm Carolyn's daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I sorry. It's just it's maternal and directorial pride that you see in this space right now. Um, and playing herself, Billy Joe Rich, telling her own story. Thank you, Billy Joe. Okay. She says, that's it. That's all I got to say is that's me. Um, my friend, Brenda, right. Wanda... oh, go ahead, Billy Joe. Did you want to say Oh, something? I was just going to say, sorry, I had a lot of background noise, so I didn't want to do my mic, but I just want to say it's such a, a huge honor to work with all of you. And I just want to thank you all for helping tell these stories. Brenda Bonda. Hello there, everyone. Yes, Brenda Banda, I'm here in Downey, California. It is an honor. I love learning. Carolyn lo knows that I love learning. And, and this play got me, I didn't know any of this, you know, I, a lot of us stay ignorant and it's a pleasure to, um, for, to, for you all to have me and for me to learn so much. Um, and um, very thought provoking. I will be having conversations with Carolyn afterwards for this. So, Thank you for having me. Um, it, it was more than a pleasure. Micaela uh, Ironshell Dominguez. Boy, that was hard for me to get out your whole name today, honey. But um, introduce um, Mika Ironshell Dominguez. How Madakiapi Chante Nape Chiazapi. Hello to you all. I welcome you all with a heart, heartfelt handshake. My name is Micaela Ironshell Dominguez. I'm Chichanga Lakota and Chicana. I'm currently on the lands, homelands of the Cheyenne, the Ute, and the Arapaho. Uh, I come from the Rosebud Sioux tribe in Rosebud, South Dakota. Um, it's such an honor to be here with you all and to definitely um, be a part of such a beautiful but very hard uh, story, right? Um, so, I thank you all and, and being in this place with you all. How? Wopila. Thank you. And Tommy Cummings. <laughs> um, my name is Tommy Cummings. I am of Creek and Choctaw descent. Um, I'm always just grateful and humble to be a part of this production. And for the first time, not getting reprimanded in person from Carolyn for mischievous oh, deeds. I'll stop talking. <laughs> Let me just say lots of mischievous deeds. And everybody knows. Yes, you all, you, if y'all know Tommy, you know. But anyway, thank you. And then Yolanda, um, thank you. Yolanda was played in the in the play by um, Micaela Ironshell Dominguez. And Yolanda is here um, to be part of the panel and to talk about um, talk about her story. So Yolanda, welcome. Where are you calling from? We have to turn your mic. I know, it's all the Zoom stuff. There, there you go. go. I found it. <laughs> I'm here in Montana on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation in Blame Deer. Yeah, it's... Uh... We've been pretty cold, minus degrees now. Mm. <laughs> minus three this morning. Oh, toasty. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. I haven't ever um, actually even watched a play like this before or um, 
and part of it kind of brought up a lot of emotions, you know, mm -hmm. part for everybody. But um, I really appreciate the, um, I was thinking about this with the, um, the audience that you're providing us to, you know, because there's a lot of, um, it's American Bar Association, a lot of legal minds mm -hmm. uh, take this in. Uh, I know in our advocacy, we've run into a lot of people that just, they don't know the extent of, of this issue. And they're always really shocked when we share our story and our other stories in our in our community here. Uh, you know that the ones that I know of in Montana um, that we've been working alongside with. You know, um, one of the things that kind of really hit me was uh, with the MMU because our family was very um, excited. We, we, we felt hope when uh, we were told that the MMU would, you know, look into Kaysera's case and ran up to, against the same barriers with the Kern County not wanting to share. Um, the same with um, similar cases after that also that we run into, we're, we're seeing a, we're seeing a, Kind of the same uh, parallel with all our cases. We we'll run up to run up. It, it doesn't matter if it's the FBI, the BIA, or the counties that we're dealing, you know, with officials like in any of these counties here in Montana. It's still, we're still running up against the same barriers, mm. and it, it could be jurisdictional, or it could be just the fact that we're native and our lives don't matter. You know, they're so used to putting us in that category that it's it's um, like on the one, uh, the one story where she said, my daughter's not an animal to be hunted. And that really stuck with me because I really feel like it relates to Kay Sarah also. And you know, and the, um, and just like a carcass, they just dumped her, you know. And so it's it's something um, on a larger scale. I, 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 you know, of course we always carry hope, but on a larger scale, I, I'm hoping that our advocacy and working with other other organizations that we're going to be able to make some really big, definite changes. I'm hoping we're starting small grassroots, but we want to keep moving. And, you know, a lot of times it's just really, really difficult and have really bad bouts of uh, depression and inactivity, but we just get back going again, you know. Um, and I, how I you... Really, you know, that, that I was <laughs> here, I'm trying to look at the screen here that played the MMU lady. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that, was so, that was just so good. And my son messaged me too. He's like, oh, the, MM, what, the MMU lady, laugh out loud. We <laughs> <laughs> just well, uh, went I'm through glad, that. I'm glad we that he got to see. That. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just said I'm glad that he got to see um, see himself on, on, you know, in the play too. So, but yeah, that that MME, and that was something that Mary Catherine had said is that they were just pushing, you know, counseling, counseling, mm -hmm. counseling, and it's like, okay, I don't need counseling. I want justice for my granddaughter. Yeah, she sat with us, you know, and then in the, um, in these uh, subsequent encounters with them, it's not always a meeting, but um, <clears throat> that's what it's been whether it's email correspondence or just stopping by my office, you know, unannounced, it's, it's always, uh, well, we got to get the, you know, well, mm -hmm. uh, victims specialist or whatever they call them, you know, here right. to like, right. and that's been kind of a barrier also because we are not able to meet on zoom or anything unless she's available and it's on 
her schedule is available. So I don't, I don't understand that, you know. It's, you know, it, it, it just feels like just constant roadblocks, you know, mm -hmm. thrown in your way. And I know that, you know, Melissa has shared, has shared similar experiences. Mm -hmm. um, Billy Joe has shared, you know, similar experiences. Lisa mm -hmm. has shared um, similar experiences. And I know a lot mm -hmm. of us have been through, you know, been through that. So, you know, even though some of us are actors portraying um, you know, real people, we're mm -hmm. all indigenous people and we've all experienced, you know, in some way, the, you know, the roadblocks that are thrown in our way. And, and the, 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 the most amazing issue to me is that the Supreme Court has given power back to the states, but, and so, which I feel like is so throwing out, you know, 250 years, 300, almost 300 years of Indian law. You know, I, I, I'm not attorney, an attorney. I just love playing one on TV. So for all you ABA folks out there, I'm not an attorney, but, you know, but I just, you know, want to say that it, that I just, it's, it's amazing to me that, you know, with the level of incompetence that, um, you know, especially on this, you know, with, without being political, but, you know, do your research, you have clerks, you have, you know, attorneys in your offices, you have, you know, do, do the research and learn about sovereignty and learn about Indian law. When you are making decision, you can't make a decision and give the state jurisdiction in Indian tribe. To me, that makes no sense, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, so what are, um, what are some of the, you know, the, and, and I know some of, some of the actors and, and folks have to leave. I know that, that, that we all were, and I'm not sure, Ali, how much time we have left um, for the panel to talk about, but, um, and this might be, you know, something to open up to everybody, but in terms of, you um, of the you know the recent passage of the reauthorization of VAWA in 2022, um, what does that mean? I mean, it seems like the the sliver of the full moon, you know, since 2013 has gotten a little bit bigger, but it still feels like it's only this much. Right. So in terms of you know with with the passage now. Um, you know, what, it, what is the fight now? Is the fight towards restoring sovereignty and restoring, um, and restoring, you know, justice overturning Oliphant? Is that, you know, what the next, you know, what the next strategy is? Or what does, you know, what does VAWA 2022 20, tell us in terms of moving forward? <laughs> You know, as for me, this really this really helped me to understand a lot more as, as, as a, a time frame, a timeline of, of VAWA. And um, mm -hmm. I, I'm not too, um, I guess, I don't have a really great understanding of all of it, but this, this uh, play really helped me a lot. Um, in our little area here, um, we turned toward, um, since Bighorn County was uh, unwilling to share any cases, we turned toward the midterm elections and we attended um, the Republicans. Well, so I live 65 miles from the county seat in Hardin where uh, K. Sarah's body was found. And so we attended the uh, Republican sheriff's debate and we questioned them and asked, you know, direct questions, pretty hard questions, and um, asked them to be on record. And uh, after that first debate was a primary debate, debate then we um, decided to hold our own and invite, because there was hard, there was just very few natives there at the first one, so to hold our own and invite them, and then we streamed it online for people that couldn't make it so that they could, you know, listen to the candidates and see 
the responses and see if this is an important issue for them. Right. And then for the general election, uh, once again, we attended the, the Kern County uh, Republican debate and we were able to ask questions there and, and um, you know, just keep bringing this forward and bringing it forward. So through this election, uh, we were able to uh, help uh, our one of the native candidates. Uh, he's the newly elected sheriff and he has uh, committed to uh, working with outside organizations like MMU, FBI, even our Montana um, Department of Justice. Bighorn County will work with their own Montana Department of Justice. And um, we were also able to support the new county attorney who has like uh, in one of the, one of the, through the play, I, I recognize that uh, she, or not through the play, but through the comments right now, these after comments um, has worked, lived, raised in Hardin, uh, went to school there, has been, she's not native, but she has many native uh, friends and connections. She's worked um, uh, in tribal courts. She's worked with tribal law. She's very, she's uh, brought up, um, you know, different um, possible um, funding sources, grants. She's looked into intervention programs. And so this is something that, um, you know, when we when we talked with her and have stuff out that just as just as a basic thing, you know, to hope hope for all of our cases that they can be reviewed again. You know, our our case Sarah's case still is open, but um, they said they'd be willing to share all even all the closed cases to, to get the help that's needed and. I just uh, messaged my son and said, uh, remind me how many cases, you know. Mm. So there's 44 cases that we know. Of. Um, we're not talking about way, way, way back, but, and 75% are not solved. And uh, so we're hoping to make headway, you know, with these newly elected officials and, um, where they're agreeing to work with these outside uh, justice organizations to help. And, and of so course, we able. You were oh, able. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say. So even with, um, you know, talking about the power of getting folks out there to to, you know, make change by voting, mm -hmm. it sounds like you were able to you know convince some folks to come out and support candidates mm -hmm. who would be more supportive. Okay. And a, a lot of it is just, you know, I always feel like I'm, I'm just not knowledgeable enough or not doing enough or uh, I get kind of hard on myself sometimes, but uh, we try to have vigils. Uh, we, we've been having an annual run. We um, have rallies and we support other, other families with their rallies. And um, we had... Um, for the first year, it's always difficult. I don't. I this is one thing I don't understand with our tribal officials of ha having them uh, participate in any way to try to get them to come. I was encouraged this summer. Our our at our annual powwow here, the powwow committee included um, a red dress special to bring awareness that they sponsored, and so it was you know. And then they have us families here that are part of MMIP, um, they consulted and asked, you know, different things to do and how to bring it out, you know. And so that was one step, but I, you know, haven't really had much uh, participation in any of our rallies. I don't, I don't just don't see them. And so we had midterms here too. Uh, we have newly elected council um, members. That, so one of the goals is to start working with them you know, one-to-one, -one, just go in their offices and talk with them and, and try to get them committed. And um, I know, you know, everybody like versa Mary Catherine, such an inspiration. And um, I was, I remember a discussion we had and that was, that was one that I know was on everybody's minds. And so, you know, we're, 
we're, we're supposed to have that protection no matter where we're at. There's no invisible line anywhere. So whether a native person dies, you know, any land, anywhere they, where they pass away or they're murdered or whatever, there should be that um, investigation at that level. And it's always policy, policy, policy. We have to change that. So if there, I, I see a lot of um, family members on the chat. Um, Blossom, thank you so much for for being here and, and, and sharing in the chat. Um, Alan, thank you um, for, for sharing and, and, um, and family members of Sias. Uh, I saw may have logged on for a minute um, and Jess may have logged on for a minute. So thank you uh, to the family members um, who are there and who are allowing us to tell your stories um, and, and, and sharing that with us. So um, honestly, what we can say to um, the ABA is to uh, work with communities um, you know, educate yourselves on on the issues. Um, educate, you know, Indian law again is so broad and so um, and but under attack. You know, we you know, ICWA is under attack. Um, the uh, Indian Child Welfare Act um, is under attack right now. We have this Supreme Court that is um, making all of these. Um, you know, all of these decisions in Indian country, this is a very anti-Indian um, court, um, you know, and they will not, um, you know, given their, their track record in terms of, of Indian law, they will not support um, uh, anything that upholds the, the dignity and sovereignty of native nations. And so we have to hold them accountable to the work that they're doing and, and, you know, as our communities are doing and the work that the women's coalitions and the anti-violence coalitions are doing um, in our communities and support support them and and also help get the word out about, um, about Kaysera's case, about Braven's case, about um, Aubrey Dameron, you know, I mean, I, all of us know and are affected by uh, somebody who has got, who, you know, is a missing and murdered indigenous relative, whether it's somebody we know personally or somebody that we, um, that we're related to. I mean, Indian country is so small. We all know someone who has been, who has been a victim and we all know someone who's a survivor. So, uh, please, um, Go ahead, Ned, uh, Jane. Go ahead. I'm I'm very glad that Mary include uh, Alaska. Thank you. That it it's been gone on for over 20 years in the state. It's I think I think more than that, and that it was very brutal at first, and uh, defacing and taking the fingernails and hiding them, and you never found. I mean, the state of Alaska is so huge that you never found those people. And then the uh, sex trafficking came in, and, but it also had to do with some of our people addicted, selling their own family. Mm -hmm. So we have to, as a family, address that as well. And um, the, the, the area of, um, like you could get money to the missing women, the, the organization, which is uh, wonderful. And I've living in, in Montana for over 20 years, almost 30, that um, I've seen the areas of working and the areas of where it disconnected. And it was like, it, you have to, there's a way we could connect you know, to make these things stronger. It's, it's uh, our connection is there. And I think even uh, I have to speak from my own area that I know from my area, we have tribal wars and we always had those wars. We as a tribal people 
like my grandmama would be very uh, upset still to this day of, from her grave. She would say, why are you talking to an Eskimo? Yeah. We, we, had, we have those divisions already. And we as a people have to come together. And that's our weakness, is not coming together. It's, it, you know, so, uh, but even the monies that are sent, like, to an organization, how much of that money stays within an organization before it's used for something else other than what it was sent to? So those are areas you have to look into, you know, and... Uh, but I'm glad that this is out there for women who are missing, and some of them are still missing, a lot of them. Thank you. Well, I know that we've, we've gone over, Ali, we've gone over time a little bit for, um, for the discussion, but I want to thank ABA for this opportunity. Um, I want to thank the families and survivors who came on and who um, are telling your stories. Um, Yolanda, thank you so much. Yeah, and I want to thank everyone, the whole and cast and Mary Catherine and ABA. It's a great, great platform. Yeah. And, and all of our love to Mary Catherine. She popped in for a minute and was texting me and was saying how, how excited she was and, and how wonderful this was. So thank Mary Catherine for continuing not only her work as a playwright, but her work as a legal playwright, you know? And Carolyn, to you as a director, thank you. Oh, thank you, Jane. Thank you. I love all, it's, you know, it, it, it's, I, you know, again, special place um, in my heart for this play, having worked on it since the very beginning um, with Mary Catherine on it and coming in and out, you know, over a long period of time. And and uh, many of us have worked on it together before. And just, but to be able to keep the stories out there of our communities and, and to hold all of our survivors um, in deep thought and prayer and, and great love. That's that's very important. So um, community members, ABA members, um, Ali, the, the ABA staff, uh, the CSRJ um, staff, um, thank you all again uh, to all the coalitions who continue to do this work. And um, let's let's keep this fight going because it's, it's non-ending. So thank you. Um, to everyone uh, out there in the chat and all of our love and prayer and support. Um, Yolanda, to you and your family and uh, Blossom to you and your family. Um, Alan, you and your family, all of the, the folks um, who are there and that we continue to keep, keep our stories out there so people know. Okay, much love.